Hi, everybody. Happy Thanksgiving, and welcome to Every Nation GTA. My name is Bert, and we're so glad that you've joined us today for worship, whether this is your first time or whether you're a regular. We're beginning a new sermon series today, looking at Jesus' most famous sermon, where he lays out how we can be truly happy. And it's not intuitive. Some of the things he says are part of his upside down kingdom, counterintuitive ways of living. Our in-home worship services are gaining momentum, where people are gathering in homes to watch the live stream together. We hope that you're enjoying that increased connection and community. Today's service host is Alex, so say hi to him. Join in the chat. We love that interaction. And if there's someone that you can think of to stir up to come to church right now, why don't you reach out to them with a message or share this live stream on your social media platform. And now let's go ahead and join our live service. Welcome to Every Nation GTA, everybody. And my name is Jacob Moon. I'm so glad that you're here with us this morning. Let's open this morning with our call to worship. O Lord, O Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly, heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. O Lord, O Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Let's pray. Lord God, maker of heaven and earth, we gather together in your name. We come to offer you our worship and thanksgiving, our praise and our prayers. Come among us, living Lord. Through the power of your spirit, transform our hearts and minds so that we may recognize your presence, hear your voice, know your will, and walk in your way. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. just begun I feel you want to find me cause that's what my father does I feel you want to find me cause that's what my father does Ooh, lay your burdens down Ooh, here in the father's house check your shame at the door cause it ain't welcome Love is on the move when the 
fathers in the room. Miracles take place, cynicals find faith. Love is breaking through, and the fathers in the room. Jericho walls are quaking, strongholds now shaking. Love is breaking through, and the fathers in the room. Love is breaking through. said to his disciples, therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, nor about your body, what you will put on, for life is more than food and the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens. They neither sow nor reap. They have neither storehouse nor barn, and yet God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? If then you are not able to do as small a thing as that, why are you anxious about the rest? Temptation comes my way. When I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. When I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay.
righteousness, oh God, how I need you. Lord, I need you. Those words are so true. And I pray today that our hearts would line up with the reality of those words, because it is so true that we need Jesus. We need the Lord in our lives. Uh, now is the part of our service where we do an early church prayer. And please join me as we say this prayer today. Come, Lord Jesus, take away scandals from your kingdom, which is my soul, and reign there. You alone have the right, for greediness comes to claim a throne within me. Haughtiness and self-assertion would rule over me. Pride would be my king. Luxury says I will reign. Ambition, detraction, envy, and anger struggle within me for mastery. I resist as far as I am able. I struggle according as help is giving me, given to me. I call on my Lord Jesus. For his sake, I defend myself, since I acknowledge myself as wholly his possession. He is my God. Him I proclaim my Lord. I have no other king than my Lord Jesus Christ. Come then, O Lord, and disperse these enemies by your power, and you shall reign in me, for you are my king and my God. Amen. That's an incredible prayer. And the Lord reigns in you as a believer and follower of Jesus today. He reigns in us wholly, and we declare that. I pray that you just have a tremendous uh, experience today as you join with us. Thanks so much for doing that. And we've just got some more Every Nation members that would like to give you a welcome this morning. Welcome to Every Nation Church. We are so glad you're joining us today. Our church is part of the Every Nation family of churches and ministries in over 80 nations around the globe. Here at Every Nation GTA, we are a diverse people that desire to see the greater Toronto area transformed as people find hope and purpose and follow the call upon their life. Wherever you may be in your own journey of faith, we'd love to help you take your next step. And now, let's meet some of our church community. Welcome to Every Nation GTA and welcome to our church service. My name is Abigail Coley. I am a pharmacovigilance and medical information scientist. If you're new here, we love to connect with you. Please visit our website, find our new tab, and fill out the guest card. Or if you're watching live, simply type new in the chat. I know that we've been having really challenging times due to the pandemic. However, this is the perfect season to spend time with God, with your family and your loved ones, and put God first. And I hope today, during the service, you will hear a word that will encourage you. All right, good morning and welcome. And if you're joining us for the first time, don't know who I am. My name is Richard, and it's great to have you with us on our Sunday live stream service. And to all my Every Nation family, wherever you might be, scattered across the GTA or beyond, uh, it's great to be with you. Hopefully, you're also joining with somebody else. We've seen some great uh, images from other people doing that, and so it's great to see that being picking up in our church communities in home uh, worship gatherings. All right, we're going to jump into a brand new series that's going to take us all the way up to Advent. Can you believe that? I mean, all the way up to the first Sunday of Advent. So for the next eight Sundays, we're going to be um, in a pretty famous passage of teaching uh, that Jesus gives. And the title of this series is going to be Pursuing Happiness. Now, last summer, I was pretty happy. We bought a new car. Um, and why I was happy is I loved our old car. Our old car was 12 years old. She served us faithfully. But towards the end, she began to show a lot of wear and tear and began to become like a money pit. And so we had to face the decision to uh, retire her and begin to uh, buy a new car. But we had never bought a new car. All our cars have been secondhand. And so uh, this made me really happy, the, the new car smell. Um, and also all the technology, when you're, when you're driving a car that's from the 2009, you have zero technology in there, besides maybe a CD player, 
But that's it. And so with all this brand new car, this 2020 model car that we purchased at 80 kilometers in the odometer, I mean brand new, out the box, literally, um, made me very happy. And, uh, and, and to be totally honest, one year and a couple of months on from that, I'm still pretty happy when I'm driving that car. I will say it's lost its new car smell. And it's not quite the same happiness that I had when I was purchasing it. In fact, I've noticed that um, there's been a shortage in brand new cars, been a shortage in a microchip that's delayed the production of cars. And so they've talked about how the price of secondhand cars have kind of gone up. And so at the back of my mind I thought, well, wouldn't a 2021 model be quite nice to drive? It's got a couple of more extra features. How about that? And so it made me think as we're thinking about happiness, how um, my economics professor, as a first-year student at the University of Cape Town, taught a class of first-years, 18-year-olds, uh, something called the Law of Diminishing Returns, which basically states that the longer time goes on, the return you get from something goes down. And because he was speaking to a bunch of first-years, he used the example of drinking. And he said, yeah, that first drink, that first beer, first glass of wine, Great, your, 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 your benefit, your return is going up. Maybe the second one. He says, once you start hitting that third, that fourth, it's now beginning to, to pinnacle down and, and be go into a different trajectory. By the time maybe some of those you've hit your fifth or sixth, the law of diminishing return really has kicked in. And uh, kind of a funny thing when we think about that, but if you think about a lot of things that maybe you've looked to bring you happiness or thought this thing was going to bring you happiness, have you ever been surprised at how maybe quickly that happiness was over, how quickly you moved on from it? Or perhaps it didn't even really materialize the happiness you thought it would be. You know, we talk about drinking, we talk about cars, but you can talk about relationships, I'm looking to a relationship potentially, a person. Maybe you're married, maybe you had this ideal that if you just married the right person, uh, happiness would be yours for the rest of your life and the reality of marriage has now shattered that illusion. Uh, maybe it's a career choice or a job, that job. If I just got that job, I got that promotion. If I just moved into that home or that apartment, and the list goes on. And so um, this is not just my story, your story. This is everyone's story. Because the pursuit of happiness or the, the need for happiness is so intrinsic to us as human beings and yet so elusive to us. And that's what we're going to be exploring over the next few weeks. While we all know we want to feel happy, it's clear that we don't always know what actually makes us happy. I'll say that again. While we all know we want to feel happy, it's clear that we don't always know what actually makes us happy, what makes us stay happy. Um, let me give you, take this out, this quote from a Psychology Today article. It says, according to some measures, We've grown sadder and more anxious during the same years the happiness movement flourished. Let me just pause there quickly there. And so in the early 2000s, there's, there was this massive boom of um, the happiness movement. Thousands, literally thousands of books flooded the market on how to be happy, um, how to achieve happiness, um, a market, a, a marked uh, increase from what had previously been on the shelves topic. And arguably, in the last 20 years, with just the advancement of technology, the advancement of certain things, the, this idea that the future is heading towards progress, we're getting better, um, led everyone to feel that we should be happier. And yet what society and what social science is telling us, and what maybe you know anecdotally, is 20 years into this century, 20 years into this millennium, um, we're maybe less happy. Um, anxiety is off the charts. Uh, we're nowhere near um, flourishing like we thought we may, maybe were going to be 20, 30 years ago. This article goes on to say, Russ Harris, a medical doctor turned counselor and author of The Happiness Trap, calls popular conceptions of happiness dangerous because they set people up for a struggle against reality. They don't acknowledge that real life is full of disappointments, loss, and inconveniences. He says, if you're going to live a rich and meaningful life, Harris says, you're going to feel a full range of emotions, a struggle against reality. And I wonder if our popular conceptions or misconceptions, as the article says, about happiness, happiness is when you get that job, when you get that relationship, when you buy that shiny new thing, that it sets us up because it's a struggle against reality, that somehow in our minds, happiness, a world of happiness doesn't have disappointment or loss 
or inconvenience. And yet we know that that is reality. To highlight the confusion and unhappiness in our culture, many universities and colleges are now offering courses on happiness and well-being. Uh, take, for example, the prestigious university, Yale University. Now, if you know anything about Yale University, it attracts a certain type of person. Usually these are potentially people from well-to-do backgrounds, people that are uh, maybe driven to excel in their grades. It's, it's hard to get into a Yale. And so you would think that these people represent uh, what we would sometimes have conceptions of happiness. They, they're well off, or they've achieved success academically at least, or maybe they're there because they're on sports scholarship or whatever it may be. Um, and so this one professor, Dr. Lori Santos, offered a psychology and the good life course, and it's now the most popular course in the 300-year history of Yale University. One in four Yale students is enrolled for this course. And listen what she has to say as she describes this course. The course begins by introducing some misconceptions that you too may have about what makes for a satisfying life. We'll see that many things we think matter for our happiness, wealth, material possessions, even good grades, simply don't. In fact, recent studies suggest that these goals may even undermine our sense of well-being. Can you imagine that? She's talking to some very uh, ambitious young people. I love the part of the good grades because, you know, I'm a parent. We've got some parents here. How much pressure sometimes we put on our kids to achieve good grades. Why? Because we want them to be successful or we want them to have a happy or good life. And yet that may be causing them an anxiety. It might be setting them up for not success, but failure. That maybe we're trying to prepare them for success. But in preparing our kids for success, are we also preparing them for reality? Like that previous uh, quote was talking about. That life is full of disappointments. Life is full of loss. Life is full of inconveniences. Are you prepared to face that? Um, life is not going to be a bed of roses. Happiness is hard thing to come by a lot of times because we're looking at for in the wrong places. And so perhaps we've thought about happiness all wrong. Um, I think we really actually have. We have misconceptions of happiness, certainly in the way God intended for us to be happy. In fact, even the title of the series is quite funny because pursuing happiness is actually self-defeating. Uh, listen to what Viktor Frankl, now Viktor Frankl, if you don't know who Viktor Frankl is, or maybe you never wrote, re read his book, uh, A Man's Search for Meaning, is an Austrian uh, psychiatrist and survivor of the Holocaust. And he documents his experience through that in this book, A Man's Search for Meaning, a, a bestseller. I know it's prescribed in a lot of uh, high schools to read. And if you haven't read it, I really think that would be a fantastic read for you, even for young people to read. Listen to what he says about this very thing. He says, it is the very pursuit of happiness that thwarts happiness. Happiness cannot be pursued, it must ensue. In other words, happiness is the result of pursuing something else that's meaningful and purpose. When you make happiness your goal in life, it will always remain elusive to you. When you said, well, I just want to, I want to work hard to enjoy the life, it's going to remain very elusive to you. Happiness comes as we pursue more weighty, meaningful things. Um, maybe best said by C.S. Lewis, if I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. If none of my earthly pleasures satisfy it, that does not prove that the universe is a fraud. Probably earthly pleasures were never meant to satisfy it, but only to arouse it to suggest the real thing. And so happiness ensues as you and I pursue being the person God's called us to be, and living the way God intended for us. And so Jesus invites you and I to be happy. He really does. God is committed to your deep happiness. But it's a happiness that's counterintuitive and more substantive than what we may think uh, pursuing happiness entails. So for the next eight weeks, we're going to sit at the feet of Jesus and look and listen to him talk about happiness. And we're going to hear him talk about happiness through a famous passage called the Beatitudes. Matthew 5, chapter 1 through 12, it's the beginning of the most famous sermon Jesus ever preached, the Sermon on the Mount. And he begins it with these Beatitudes. I'm going to read it, and then we're going to take one of the eight Beatitudes each week and focus in on that. So join me in Matthew 5, verses 1. 
Seeing the crowds, Jesus went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. He opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the poor in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So you might read that and you would say, Richard, I don't see any happiness in there. I don't even see the word happy in there. And, um, and here's why. It's because that word blessed is the Greek word makarios, and it could literally also mean fortunate or happy. And so I prefer happy because I think blessed is one of those words, especially in Christian circles, that is kind of used so often that it's lost its meaning. And so happy, I think, is the way that we want to go because I think we all have an idea of what, hap- at least what we think happiness is and all certainly want to be happy and live a happy life. And so we're going to look at that, what it means to be happy. And Jesus is telling us what it means to be happy. Now, this happiness is not external. It's not flimsy. But this kind of happiness, this kind of blessedness is the highest type of well-being that a human being um, can achieve. Uh, another word that we've been using in the last few weeks is flourishing. Uh, I think that's a great word of understanding the kind of deep happiness that Jesus is committed to offering you and I. And the key to understanding happiness or the key to understanding uh, our human potential and flourishing is to understand the kingdom of heaven. Because a few verses prior in Matthew chapter 4 verse 17, Jesus set up this entire sermon that he was about to go into with these words. He says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent is a word that means change. It means you need to change something. You need to stop and change something in your mind and your thinking. You need a new frame of reference. Why? Because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then he begins to expound that through the Sermon on the Mount, what this kingdom of heaven is all about. So central to understanding Jesus is the idea. to is this idea of the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. It's used interchangeably. Um, it's the good news that Jesus preached. It's central to understanding the Gospels. Uh, it's the idea of shalom in the Old Testament, of peace um, in every which way, relationally, justice, uh, flourishing human, flourishing physically, uh, socially, our relationship with God. And it's Jesus' favorite subject, he taught the most often. Most of the parables are um, in some way re- uh, relatable to the kingdom. He's teaching us about this kingdom. So we don't live in mid- you know, medieval England. And so the, the idea of kingdom sounds kind of archaic. It's like kind of like Games of Thrones to us or something like that. How do we reference kingdom in our 21st century? Well, pray an easy way to understand a kingdom is like an embassy, right? Have you ever been in downtown Toronto and you've seen the U.S. consulate or an embassy? Maybe you're from a country and a nation um, outside of Canada and you've had to make use of an embassy here in Canada. And so an embassy really, what an embassy is, it's a place that carries authority and rule on behalf of another, right? And so the Canadian embassy in another country carries the rule and authority of Canada operating in that other country. Not only does it carry the rule and authority, it's, it's there to promote the values and the culture of that country. It's to be a good advertisement for that country. Hey, Canada's great. You should come and check it out sometime. It's kind of like, and we all know Canadians are loved and beloved all over the world. So yay, Canada. And so that's an understanding of what we talk about this kingdom. The kingdom of God is simply where God's rule and reign is. And it's as we come in, the authority of God's rule and reign is in that place. And we're to promote the values and the culture of that kingdom. We're to be an embassy, so to speak, in this world of another world. The kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God here on earth. And so the Beatitudes then become this kind of kingdom manifesto. This is what life is like. This is what people are like in the kingdom of heaven. And it's often very different to what uh, society says. Oftentimes, this kingdom is upside down. 
seems counterintuitive. You know, the first one we're going to look at today is blessed are the poor. Really, we think poor are happy, so we'll, we'll unpack that a bit. It's an inside-out kingdom. If you notice as we went through those eight attitudes, these are very much internal qualities. These are internal postures of the heart that determine a meaningful, uh, happy life. And then this kingdom is both an already not yet. In other words, we can participate right now with Jesus in building his kingdom on earth, knowing that we still anticipate the fullness of that kingdom, right? That fullness, this is what we anticipate. This is what we, the, we long for, for the second coming of Christ to bring and usher in once and for all that kingdom rule, God's full rule, his full reign, his full culture, the kingdom of heaven fully once again invading earth. But until that time, we can still participate in that. And so we're going to end off today, last few minutes, just looking at this first one. Happy are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Happy are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. When you think of a poor person, what comes to mind? You know, oftentimes you might think of a, a, someone on the side of the road begging. And so the idea that's been put before us here is a poor person is someone who's lacking the essentials for life. They're really lacking essentials for life. Clothing, food, water, shelter. They're lacking something that's essential for, for life and obviously for flourishing in life, which makes them desperate, which makes them dependent upon others. That's why they're begging. They need help. And so Jesus now translates this and says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for this is the kingdom of heaven, is that is, is the posture of those that are in the kingdom. Is that we recognize that without God, we lack the essentials of life. It doesn't matter how rich or affluent or well-off we may be in other areas, externally, physically, materially, career-wise, whatever. The absence of God makes us spiritually bankrupt and so leads us to be desperate and hopefully dependent upon God. Um, and here's the challenge. Our pride and God's grace towards us really don't mix very well. God offers us the riches of his kingdom. God invites us into a deep happiness. But for various reasons, we're very resistant to that. We don't want the authority of another telling us what's good and what's evil. We don't want another telling us how to live our lives. We don't want to be dependent upon another. We want to have independence. And that's our challenge. We were never created to have full independence from God. Part of our wiring is to be dependent upon him. And when we, 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 when we back against that, we have challenges and problems of lives. We're not designed that. We're working against our design. And so what often happens is our pride sets us up to be self-sufficient and independent. In other words, living life outside the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven, and thereby foregoing all the benefits that life in the kingdom offers. And so Jesus is teaching us in this very first one that happiness ensues when we see our deep need for God and run to God to meet our deep need. That happiness ensues when we see our deep need for God. We recognize our spiritual poverty. We recognize our poverty before him and run to God to meet our deep need. And I don't want to over-spiritualize the poor in spirit. In the other passages in Luke, he doesn't even say the in spirit part. He says, blessed are the poor. And so I don't think there's any necessary um, piety around being poor. But what I will say this, it does seem that there's a correlation. You know, part of the greatest growth in Christianity right now is, is in what's called the global south. South America, America, and Asian nations, typically countries that are third world. And where we're seeing the biggest decline in Christianity is in Europe and North America, typically countries that are seen as very well off. And so there, I think there is a connection is when we as a society or even we as individuals get to a level of status of um, living a, a comfortable life, let's say, not necessarily off the scale rich, but well, comfortable, you're able to provide for your needs. It becomes so difficult for us to depend upon God. We depend upon ourselves, our own intellect. We depend upon ourselves in so many ways. And so I think there is a correlation sometimes to people that are, experience a desperation just in the material world have a desperation in themselves there. And so sometimes um, 
sometimes we're, uh, we've got to be careful, particularly in a, a beautiful country like Canada, that we're lulled into a comfort that removes a dependence upon God that he wants us to have. It's not to say that God can't bless us. It's just to say we need to have the right priority of those in our lives because possessions can be great until they start possessing you, and then they're actually a curse. They're actually a curse. And so sometimes getting the bigger thing, getting the promotion, getting the whatever may not be the will of God. It may be a trap, a setup. And so in our culture, we just don't even think about that. We just think of anything bigger, better as God's blessing. And it might not always be the case. It requires discernment. And many people have been shipwrecked by chasing after riches and um, neglecting their faith. And so what we need to do is confess our spiritual bankruptcy. It doesn't matter how well things are going in my life. Praise God if that's happening. But recognize, God, I rely upon you for breath. You know, we, Aaron was telling us earlier, Lord, they're connecting that song, Lord, I need you. Every day I need you. I need you more today than I did yesterday. And then to increasingly repent of our pride, our independence, repent of the things that want us to just, I've got this, God, I don't need you, and to receive the gift of the kingdom and his rule and his reign. And so the question for you is, do you recognize your poverty and dependence on God? And before you quickly answer it, Think about it. When you live your life, do you live it in such a way that you make your plans, that you make your decisions, and you ask God to bless that? And again, be very careful before how quickly. No, I would never do that. How quickly we do do that. We make plans. Going to move here. Going to take that job. Oh, God, would you pray for that? Would you pray for that? Without consulting God, God, is this what you want me to do? It's one small example that goes a long way to show a dependence upon God. I'm not saying get bogged down the minutia of every single decision. God, should I put on the black socks or the white socks today? What is your will for me? But to live our lives. But it shows a marked independence when we don't consult God. We just ask him to bless what we've already decided. And there's a big difference with that. A life partner, a boyfriend, a girlfriend. God, is this the person that you're wanting me to build a life with? Uh, John Mark Comer in his brand new book, Live No Lies, um, writes about this. Uh, he says, Ignatius of Loyola, the founder of the Jesuit order, is credited with defining sin as unwillingness to trust that what God wants for me is only my deepest happiness. In the ultimate irony, sin sabotages our capacity for happiness by appealing to our God-given desire for happiness via deceptive ideas. There's a lot in there. I love that definition of sin. There's many ways that you can describe or define sin, but how about defining sin as this? When I sin, it's an unwillingness of me to trust that what God wants for me is only my deepest happiness. And sometimes we pursue things outside of the will of God because we think that's truly what's going to make me happy. God, I know, I know I should probably marry someone who shares my faith and my commitment, my beliefs, but I really like this girl. And even though she's not a Christian yet, uh, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lead her to Christ and boom, pursue it. And I've seen this play out. Why I use that example? Because I've seen it play out in so many which ways. Um, and, and so what happens is we think we know better. And ultimately, we live out what we really believe. Like, I really can make a life that's happy, independent of God. And what John Mark Comer is telling us is that the, the devil and the forces against us are so subtle, are so deceptive, is that they actually appeal to this God-given desire for happiness. It's okay for you to want to be happy. How you pursue that happiness is an entirely different conversation. It's a God-given desire for us to want to live a well well and good life, a meaningful life, a purposeful life, a life full of well-being and flourishing. That's what the kingdom's all about. It's about restoring all that was lost. That's what Jesus invites us into. But we need to do it the Jesus way in order to get that. And so oftentimes it's the appeal to these God-given desires for happiness. It's a legitimate need through illegitimate ways. And so it'll come through subtle things. You know, again, in 20 years of pastoring, I've seen this play out in different ways. Is I deserve to be happy, but I'm not happy in my marriage. Maybe if I divorced my spouse and married that person, I deserve to be happy and to live with that person. So be careful. Divorce is a very complex situation. I'm not saying one thing applies in all situations. 
But in almost all situations, divorce is terrible. It's horrible, especially if there's kids involved. There's a great toll that divorce plays upon a people. And so we have this, this, this lie that's fed to you deserve to be happy, which sounds very much like what God wants you to be happy, but we pursue it in illegitimate ways and, and often shipwreck our lives. Perhaps to end off, again, a return to the brilliance of C.S. Lewis, who was a former atheist. If you're not sure who C.S. Lewis is, he was a former atheist that became probably arguably one of the most important voices of the 20th century in Christianity. And in his in classic book, Mere Christianity, puts it as straight as, as I could ever put it. So that's why I quote him. He says, God cannot give us a happiness and peace apart from himself because it's not there. There is no such thing. And so as we end this first session, as we dive into the next few weeks, as we apprentice under Jesus, as we join in community in our small groups and wrestle with the, the desires of our hearts to be happy and how we sometimes pursue those in illegitimate ways, as we journey together over the next few weeks, rem let me remind you of this, that God remains, God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit remains committed to your deepest happiness. And when we recognize that it's ultimately in him, then a pursuit of happiness becomes a pursuit of God himself. And when we make God our pursuit, happiness always ensues. Amen. Wow, what an incredible word this morning. Thank you so much, Pastor Richard. I'm really looking forward to listening to the rest of this series on happiness. And maybe God was speaking to you uh, as you listen to this message today. And maybe you're at a point in your life where you're not happy where you are. And things just aren't working the way you would like them to work. I'd encourage you today to turn to Jesus. Happiness cannot be found apart from him. And uh, you can do that easily today. All you need to do is say, Jesus, come into my life. Change things in my life. And God's word promises us that when we make a commitment by faith to Jesus, that things are changed. We are new creatures. We are now part of God's family and God's Holy Spirit comes to live within us. Or maybe today you're a believer and maybe you've been pursuing things that uh, don't make you happy and there, there's a lack of satisfaction in your life and God is trying to redirect your course today. He's trying to encourage you to say to do life with him in a more meaningful and significant way and whatever your next step is today, I, I pray that you would um, think about it and that you would uh, take a step in the, in the right direction, in the direction towards Jesus. So you can uh, find our Next Step cards on our website at uh, everynationgta.org, and you'll, you'll see the Next Step card. If you'd like to fill one out, uh, we'd, we'd love to have you uh, do that if there's something God is speaking to you about specifically, and we will be able to join you in that step when you let us know about it. We have a song today by Jacob, and I'd like uh, you to reflect on the message you've heard today as you listen to the words of this song. This is my father's word, and to my listening. All nature sings while round it rings the music of the spheres. This is my father's world, the birds their carols raise, the morning light, the lily white, to clear their maker's praise. my father's world 
Now is the time in our service where we worship through giving. And today I'd just like to read some of the words of Jesus found in Matthew chapter 6. Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. And today I just love to encourage you that what is really satisfying is actually seeking God and, and uh, his righteousness, being in his kingdom, walking through life with Jesus. And he has uh, that supply for you, that satisfaction for you, that happiness for you that can only be found in him. And today I'd uh, encourage you as you give to, to think of the blessing of God in your life and uh, remind you to keep seeking after him, keep following him, and he has good things for you. Uh, now on to our prayer, our offering prayer. God, our Father, everything we are and have belongs to you. Out of your generosity, you've given us so much. Today we bring our tithe to you, the first tenth of what you've already given to us. We desire to give as an act of worship and to become more generous like you. We pray that you will help us steward the possessions that you have entrusted to us and guard our hearts from the deceitfulness of riches that seek to choke your word from our hearts. We give in faith, knowing that you will be true to your word by opening up the windows of heaven to meet all of our needs. Bless this offering and use it to advance your kingdom. Amen. For those of you who like to give online, I'll give you about 30 seconds to do that now. As for announcements today, I'd like to continue to encourage you to gather for in-home worship. And uh, what a tremendous opportunity it is, not only to fellowship with other people, but to worship together, to hear the word together, and to pray together. And if you're fortunate, maybe you'll be able to eat together as well. So I'd, I'd, I'd like to uh, just encourage you to continue doing that. And if you'd like to participate in that, you can still fill out a next step card. 
and put that in there that you'd like to be a part of in-home gatherings. We also meet during the middle of the week or, or throughout the week, I should say, because we have small groups that run uh, just about every day of the week uh, besides Monday. And if you would like to uh, get together with some people during the week, we would love to invite you and see you be part of one of our many small groups located around the GTA. And uh, you can do that. Uh, you, can, you can find one if you haven't found one on uh, already. Uh, they're just listed on our website, and we'd encourage you to, to be part of one. Another thing uh, that I'd like to say is that this is an essential part of actually our discipleship uh, in our following in Christ because you actually get to talk about what you believe. You get to talk about your experience and what God is doing in your life and what you are uh, thinking about God's word as you hear it on a weekly basis. So I'd love to encourage you to do that. It's also Thanksgiving this weekend, so I'd like to um, say happy Thanksgiving to all of you from uh, our church uh, leaders and pastors, as well as from my family, uh, the Amadrude family. So happy Thanksgiving to you. I hope that you have a tremendous uh, time with friends and family as you celebrate Thanksgiving. And now time for our benediction. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Mm -hmm.